So as people are logging in today, I want to remind people of two important things related to this topic. First is that open enrollment is open. So make sure you are checking the options of what health insurance you are getting uh, if you already have it. And if you don't have it, um, to make sure what options you have, there's a great New York Times article that you can check on your options and even free help available if you go to healthcare.gov. So that's super important. Also, if you recently lost your job or, or have a friend that maybe um, has recently lost job, job there because of COVID and they live here in Virginia, since a lot of our audience, I think, will be in Virginia, um, tell them to check if they're eligible for Medicaid because that is a program for uh, people who are childless adults um, and have low income. So just wanted to get those two things out of the way. So um, I think I'll start and just for a brief context, I'll talk for about uh, 15 minutes to just kind of set up the context of what we're talking about today, why is it important and all of that. And then we will, uh, I will open up for uh, Q&A. So think of this as like, you know, whatever you guys want to learn about this topic, any like doubt or, or weird question or, or maybe silly question if you think of like that, that you may have, just feel free to ask. The whole point is just for all of us to understand what's going on and understand things better. Um, there's a Q&A uh, feature, so hopefully you see it and you can submit questions there. Um, you can submit questions whenever. Um, I'll just start picking on them after I'm done with like 10 or 15 minutes of talking. So you can submit them at any time, um, but I will answer them later. All right, so with that said, let's start. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, this, the court case that is started yesterday on the Supreme uh, Court hearings about the Affordable Care Act. So what really, it's what is happening. So uh, in the Obama administration, we passed this major piece of legislation called the Affordable Care Act. And since then, there's been several attempts to repeal it or dismantle it for a variety of different political and sometimes not political reasons. And the most successful attempt of one of those was to um, have the individual mandate, which was essentially a tax law that says, if you don't have health insurance, you need to pay a penalty. Um, that penalty was converted to zero. And so that most successful you know, uh, uh, court case in, in order to repeal the ACA uh, changed the individual mandate from you know, X number of dollars to zero. And now we're seeing the, I would say, second most successful attempt to repeal the ACA in the sense that the argument that is being, um, that has passed a different course is now it's taken to the Supreme Court is, well, because the penalty is zero, the tax is not a tax. And therefore that law is not valid. And therefore the whole ACA is not constitutional. Um, and so uh, that's the, essentially the, the gist of what the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, hearing is about um, that was yesterday and, and maybe will continue going on. Um, and there's other pieces. Uh, I'm not a legal scholar, so I'm not going to go into the other pieces of whether this is um, this talks is hurting the, uh, the defendant or not or the plaintiff or not. So, you know, those are things that I'm not going to detail. The detail is that the, the individual mandate is zero, and they're using this as an argument to um, take down the whole ACA or at least parts of the ACA. Now, what is the argument about taking down the whole ACA if this one part is zero? Um, and this is because on, on the previous ruling, it says that the individual mandate is an important part of the ACA, and it's going to be a tax. And there were arguments even in the Supreme Court that says that if we actually kick this part out, if we eliminate this individual mandate part, then the whole ACA should fall with it because the ACA needs the individual mandate to succeed. So this is actually one of the arguments of Supreme Court Justice Alito. So he said, if the individual mandate is not there, we should just dissolve the whole ACA. So this is why people are paying attention because now they're bringing that argument again to the Supreme Court. Now you may be asking, well, is this true? Like, do we need the individual mandate? And now that it's zero, that the penalty is zero, maybe it's, you know, it's not like things have collapsed as we thought. And um, the answer is, is that is correct, right? Things have not collapsed in the way a lot of people thought about the ACA. And people think this is weird because we always thought about the ACA as having three main parts, which is one, this individual mandate, two, um, uh, two that it says, you know, insurance companies have to take 
um, on people, even with our pre-existing conditions and essentially guarantee issue, other things that are forcing people to uh, insurance companies to take people. And the third part is, is tax subsidies. And what's really has been happening, or at least what research has been shown, is that the tax subsidies, the premium tax rate, is, is actually a big carrot into getting people to have health insurance. And the individual mandate, the penalty was actually small enough that it wasn't really uh, affecting too many people. So once this became zero, yes, we have less people enrolling, but it wasn't as much because there still is the subsidies and the uh, guarantee issue part. So it seems that that part was not potentially as strong as we thought it was. So uh, the hearings were yesterday in the Supreme Court. Um, and overall, it seems like the likelihood of the law, of the full law standing is um, it's pretty likely. And the reasoning is one, some are of the courts are going to, of the court or the justices, sorry, are arguing that uh, well, it doesn't seem like the individual mandate was such a big deal after all, long story short. Two, they're also saying, well, if Congress really wanted to repeal the whole thing, they should have or would have done it when they turned the individual penalty to zero. Um, and three is, uh, uh, is the idea that, well, we can declare the individual mandate not constitutional because the penalty is zero, but that should not affect the rest part of the ACA. So because of those comments that different... Um, justices have given, um, we, uh, or at least some people are thinking that the law is not going to be fully repealed, which is in some sense good news. But it's 2020, we don't know what's going to happen, everything is up in, in uh, up for grabs. And so let's talk a little bit about the scenarios of what the ruling uh, could could mean. And the ruling should happen at some point ne uh, next year, some people say February, some people say June. So the, scenario, the first scenario is like nothing happens. The Supreme Court says, you know, this is still constitutional, individual mandate, even with penalty zero is fine. And so essentially nothing happens in terms of the legal aspect of the ACA. And maybe states need to come back and still um, uh, present another court case. Uh, the other uh, point that could happen is that the Supreme Court says the individual mandate is not constitutional. But that's the only thing that is not constitutional and the rest of the law still applies. Um, this is a likely scenario. And again, it's in a scenario that probably doesn't uh, matter that much in terms of policy wise because the penalty is already zero. So a penalty, from a penalty being zero to a penalty that doesn't exist, then that doesn't have much change. What some people could do, some congressmen could do is change a penalty to let's say a dollar and it would become constitutional. So that's a little bit of a workaround um, if they wanted to do that. Um, the uh, disaster scenario is they say, this, the, you know, this is not constitutional, the whole law is not constitutional. Um, we call it a disaster scenario because that would undo all the things that the ACA has done. And although not all the things were perfect, at the end of the day, that really truly means that 20 millions of Americans have gained insurance through the ACA. About 13 million of those are through the ACA Medicaid expansions, which again, they would be wiped out if they declared this, this whole law is not constitutional, and about 7 million to the healthcare market exchange. Um, this, what does this mean if like the whole ACA gets, you know, um, uh, is declared unconstitutional? 20 million people um, potentially could lose health insurance. The law about pre existing condition goes away, even though the government has said their the current administration has said they're pro it. They're pro it. Um, the current administration also has put a new law on price transparency, and that would also go away. Um, there is a number of, of changes about birth control, about uh, cost controls, about what to cover and not to cover, community ratings. There is an, a huge number of stuff that the ACA has embedded into our healthcare system that they would go away. So in some sense, that is a little bit of a nightmare scenario because a lot of those things would have to be undone. Now, what's a positive outlook if you want to have a silver lining on like that disaster scenario is that, well, A, states can decide to do their own thing. And granted, states can decide to do their own thing right now, but maybe this will push them to do those things on their own. Uh, and B is the opportunity to, you know, start from quote unquote scratch and start something new. Um, the last scenario could be that some parts uh, of the ACA could be struck down. 
Um, this could be uh, the issue about pre-existing conditions or community ratings. When, when we say community ratings, this means that private insurance companies cannot charge you cannot charge you specifically for for characteristics depending on you. They have to have at least a community rating. So they can only use certain characteristics, but they're group based. Um, that's when people talk about community ratings. Um, so we don't know which parts they would get struck down shall if the Supreme Court justices decide to just struck down some parts, but those are pretty much the ones that are a little bit in contingency. Um, what's interesting about the current context as of last week is that the, in theory, the new administration is, is which is really the Biden plan, um, is pro-expanding kind of like the Affordable Care Act. So in some sense, likely the scenarios would be that uh, they decide not to do anything, and then a Biden plan will start building up on what the Affordable Care Act has already been do done and try to do some patchwork um, in some cases, and in other cases, really change a lot of stuff. Um, so I am going to, it's 1213, I'm going to do a quick pause right there and see if people have any questions um, that are still in their head about what could happen or what it is happening, or if I need to explain something in more detail. Um, okay, so I see two questions here. One is, what is the positive outcome that is most likely from this? So the most positive outcome is actually no change. So the most positive outcome is that the Supreme Court justice decide that this case, um, that there's no actual case, that the individual mandate is that are non-constitutional, but nothing else is gonna be struck down or the individual mandate is still constitutional and nothing really changing. And so the positive outlook there is that the things that are, were implemented in the ACA are still going to stand still and we don't have to dismantle that. Now, some people may react to that and be like, well, but I don't like the ACA. That's all fair and square, but it's a lot also harder to work from dismantling to rebuild that up. Remember, you can always do even the fundamental changes without dismantling in a current law. Um, will the change in presidency will affect this process? So in some sense, it shouldn't in the sense that the Supreme Court justices are independent political actors. But uh, if we think of them as political actors, um, the change in presidency really uh, uh, will, will in theory not affect this mostly because um, once, once the, or the only way the presidency would affect it is if the courts decided to strike the whole thing down, then the new administration is the one in charge to put in the new plan. So if it were a Trump administration, they would want to put their plan in. If it were the Biden administration, they would want to put their plan in, in purpose. So right now, it seems like it would be the Biden administration, which in reality, they would just implement ACA plus, essentially. Okay, uh, there seems to be another question here. Are you able to speak to Justice Amy Coney Barrett and her jurisprudence on this. Um, I believe um, in she, I believe all the stuff that she said related to these topics are essentially very wishy-washy and very, give us not a lot of information on what her vote would be. I am actually not exactly sure if she's included in this particular hearing. I believe she is, but um, I did not get any, um, uh, or at least any of the comments she may or may not have made or questions were apparently um, not at least in the news cycle. It was more comments by John Roberts, Alito, and Kavanaugh, right? Those are usually so some of the conservative-ish justice that have indicated through their questions that they don't think this is necessarily a strong case to eliminate the whole ACA. And uh, if you do counts, there's about five of those votes. Are any states already pursuing research and policy options to implement themselves in case of this of disastrous scenario? So this is a really great question. Um, I I think the answer, well, I mean, states could be cooking something up on their own ways. Um, so I think there are some states that even before the Supreme Court case, they already started to think, what can we do? And they essentially, the idea is like, we don't wanna wait for the federal government to come in and do things if we can do some of those things our own. Um, the main problem is that a lot of those things have been in some ways paused because of COVID, right? So the big challenge with COVID has been that it's uh, made states 
run into a lot of this deficit that some people are worried about, or essentially if they wanted to expand and create their programs, they would need money. And right now they're in a situation where they are afraid of expending more money in, in things that are not necessarily COVID related. So in some sense, whatever um, policy options the states may have, um, they are probably on pause right now because of the financial implications of COVID. These are great questions. Um, I have another one too, which is, what could this mean for the current racial disparities that are already uh, exist in healthcare? So this is a good question. So something that I don't know if it's mentioned a lot or not, or at least I don't see a lot in the conversation is about how the ACA uh, diminished the racial disparities between blacks and white and Hispanics and whites in, in a bunch of different numbers. So here are some big ticket numbers if you want to remember something from this talk. The black-white health insurance gap went from 10% to 5%. So that was about a 5 percentage point reduction. And the Hispanic-white went from the gap was 25 to 20, uh, sorry, 25 to about 15, I believe. Um, so those are big reductions in the gap between health insurance of blacks and whites and Hispanics and white. That also, in some sense, affected uh, some health outcomes, specifically because um, the people who are getting the black and the minorities who are getting affected by this gain in health insurance are from like lower income populations. Um, the second important thing to remember about the ACA and racial disparities is that a lot of that work is being done on the states that expanded Medicaid. Or in other words, because of those states that expanded Medicaid, that those are where we see the gains in uh, reductions in racial disparity between blacks and whites and Hispanics and whites. So I think in some sense, this would affect it if, if, if there's a ruling in which um, they take away part of the ACA Medicaid expansions because it's a broad ruling or not, those would be the, the ways it would um, affect the racial disparities or make them worse or make them what it used to be a couple of years ago. It's all through the changes in Medicaid. That's really what's, what's driving a lot of the, um, uh, the, the improvements in racial disparities that the ACA provided. Awesome. Okay, I think I went really fast with answering those questions. Um, let, me, let me get back to one of the questions um, that uh, an audience uh, asked, which is about what are the other options? So one of the things that I think a lot of people are, are now um, uh, talking about is kind of like what Biden's plans is, um, because that's essentially also states are, are kind of waiting to see what the federal government is going to do um, to see if they need to do something or not, especially because of COVID. So what Biden plan is going to do, and this is what some states are also thinking about doing, is, is cover the gap. So if you think about the ACA, in some states you have Medicaid, right? And then you have subsidies for getting private health insurance. But sometimes you're in a position where I am too quote unquote rich to qualify for Medicaid, but I'm also, um, I cannot, uh, I don't have enough uh, of the income to qualify for the subsidies. And so essentially you're getting no help from either direction. And so part of the Biden's plan is to increase who gets the subsidy, so cover that gap, and at the same time, um, increase the subsidy, so increase the amount of, of money that the government is given to individuals to decrease their price of health insurance. So that's one thing. The other uh, idea and plan is what is known as uh, uh, Medicare option or the public option. Um, there is a lot of details about like, well, what does this really mean? Is it Medicare? Is it Medicaid? Or what kind of health insurance? But the simple idea is that the government will offer a plan across all states that either you pay into or you're eligible if you have a lower income. And the whole idea is that this will create competition, right? Because now some private insurance companies may have to compete with the plan from the government. Um, whether that will work or not, there's obviously questions, but it's an uh, interesting uh, I think policy to be thinking about. Um, and the other really key point that I don't see a lot of people talking is how to enroll in Medicaid. Enrolling in Medicaid could be a hassle and we want things to not make, <laughs> to not be a hassle. So auto enrolling in Medicaid is actually could be super important for a lot of individuals. Um, so that would be something that I would wanna pay attention to. And also that states are thinking about. Let's see, here's another question. What do you think the chances are of the law being broken up 
uh, versus X entirely. Um, so great question. Again, unfortunately, I'm an economist. I'm not a legal scholar. So this is the economist opinion on something that I'm not an expert on. But um, I think from my reading of what uh, the justices that I would be concerned about um, have said through their questioning, it seems to me that it is unlikely that the whole law would be um, taken down. Um, so for example, I'm trying to think of uh, John Roberts essentially is the one who said, you know, Congress should have striking down the law if they wanted to, but instead they changed the penalty to zero. Um, Justice Brett Kavanaugh during the oral argument says, it does seem fairly clear that the proper remedy would be to sever, sever the mandate provision and leave the rest of the act in place. So because of these types of commentary, it makes it hard for one to think that they'll go all, all in the way of, um, uh, of, of, of throwing the whole thing out. And even Alito, who is one who in 2012 was of the opinion that because of the tax mandate or maybe the mandate, they should just throw all the, the whole law, also agrees with this um, kind of type of questioning. So I, you know, I want to, I'm not going to put numbers, but it does seem unlikely from those types of questioning. Awesome. Oh, there's another question. Is it obvious to people who gain coverage under the ACA that they gain coverage because of the ACA and that their coverage would disappear if it was struck down? Um, so the, I think the question um, is about perceptions. So as in like, uh, you know, a person who has gained coverage in the past few years, do they know that it's through the ACA or not? Or maybe they think it's just through, through random events. This is a great question. I, I, don't, I don't know ex um, exactly data-informed answer on this, but my sense is that if you are getting coverage through Medicaid because your state expanded Medicaid, it's hard, it's hard for one to think that um, some people would not know that because eventually, essentially you were a child's adult that were poor and then Virginia expanded Medicaid and now you're eligible for Medicaid. So that seems a little more tangible. The, um, uh, the marketplace, so people who are buying health insurance, uh, to me, I think the only way that some people would understand that that's from the ACA is if they got in a, a tax credit. So the way the subsidies work is that you pay full price um, and then the federal government gives you a rebate when you pay your taxes, right? Um, so if they conceptualize that as part of the ACA, then yes. But this is, this is a tough question because this is about perception and, and understanding. Um, health insurance in itself, it's unfortunately very complicated. Um, and so it's unclear to what extent people think this is from the ACA or not. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, caveat and all of that, there are a num probably a number of organizations and grassroots organizations in different states that uh, if they were to struck down, that I think they were pushed on this narrative of like, this is what they're doing um, if the ACA gets struck down, especially the pre-existing conditions part, um, it, it would also go away, which is something that I think I would, I see at least um, in the Republican side that they're very pro it, or at least verbally pro it, um, but that would also be taken down. So I think we have five more minutes. Um, if anyone has more questions or anything to clarify about this topic, I think overall the feeling is somewhat positive, but we're still worried because you never know what's gonna happen. I mean, the other part, if you wanna be negative about this is like, well, if it's so such a slam dunk, why didn't even get to the Supreme Court? So the fact that it's gone into the Supreme Court is probably not a good sign, however, a lot of the cases about the ACA that go from the lower to the higher course are coming from this one particular judge, I would say, that <laughs> makes it so. So, you know, uh, there's pros and cons on that as well. Okay, it seems that uh, we've answered more all the questions and I'm sure you guys are welcome are, are excited to go have your lunch if you're not having your lunch already. So I think I will pause early there. If you have any more questions after, um, feel free to obviously send me an email. You can also tweet me at the Sebastian Tello uh, and I'll be on Twitter as well. And I can share you more resources or you know citations of where I get this information. Um, but thank you so much for coming to this quick chat Q and A. Um, 
there's a bunch of them coming. I think this is a great place for you to learn from people here in the community about the topics that are happening in the news and just ask them you know, straight up your questions. Um, so I think this is a great service that Vanna School is putting up. So thank you, Erin and Millie for organizing this. And I think I'll log out. Peace. <laughs>